Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today I'm going to talk about resolving lab conflicts. Near the end of the video, I'm going to talk about a few anecdotes that will kind of highlight the importance of de-escalating conflict in the lab. So when you're working in a research lab, it's quite common to have conflicts that are arising, and usually they occur due to poor planning or lack of communication. This kind of applies to all areas of life, but it's mostly focusing on lab conflict today. So the easiest way to prevent lab conflict is to just foresee possible issues and communicate with other people. A lot of the time it just is a matter of planning ahead of time and not letting crap hit the fan. And so one of the things you can do to make this easier is accept responsibility yourself. And this makes it easier for everyone. So even if it's not your job, you can make it your job so that no one has to suffer other than you briefly. And so one of the main common causes for conflict is limited resources. This could be a uh, low availability of test tubes, reagents, solvents, etc. And so this is always going to be an issue. This is an issue for like most people in most areas of life. Another really common cause for conflict is envy, although people tend to have hidden motives regarding envy. There's also limited access to facilities such as, uh, let's say, an NMR or a rotovap or stir plates, and so there can be conflict as a consequence of that. It's also possible that people have different opinions about how certain techniques could be done. And so sometimes those are more challenging to tune out. Additionally, people have differences in personality or temperament, and this is something that's a little bit harder to manage. Uh, but you can do this through getting to know your peers. And so the best thing that you can do in most cases is work on yourself. More often than not, you can solve your own problems easier than you can solve other people's problems. Now, one of the things that's really common is you might feel entitled to privilege access. So you might think that you're a better researcher, so you should have first access to solvents or re reagents. Or you might think because you're the postdoc or the PhD student, you have privilege over the master student or the undergrad. And while that might be the case, that's not a very like nice way to live your life, right? You might see yourself as more important, but oftentimes it's better for everyone if you just sacrifice, right? So it's important to remember that science is a team sport and you wouldn't be where you are if everyone was selfish and only cared about themselves. And you want to have a lab that's happy and productive. And again, instead of just like making it all about you, make sure you realize how important it is that everyone's doing well. You don't want to win if that means that your peers will lose. You know, no one wants to be a winner when there's no one around to celebrate with them, right? Everyone's going to be salty that, that you took advantage of the situation and you didn't care about the good of the group. And so it's important to analyze your own behavior. Could you be creating conflict? Was there something that you could have done to prevent the situation? And it's easy to say, well, it wasn't my responsibility. But until you know that you've done everything that you could have done, you can't just totally like um, absolve yourself of the blame. So if you could have ordered chemicals ahead of time, if you could have talked to people about who is in charge of what responsibility, that's one way to mitigate a lot of these conflicts. And this is oftentimes the role of the supervisor, but because the supervisor isn't always a perfect human being, sometimes it's necessary for the group members to organize themselves. And so even if it isn't your responsibility, you can still be responsible. Now, here's some common problems that you'll encounter if you're working in a lab. Someone will ask too many questions. They won't be independent enough. Someone will distract others from completing their work. They'll just talk their ear off for hours and hours. Someone doesn't treat shared equipment with stewardship. This just could mean like leaving the road of app dirty, not cleaning it out. Um, maybe you're making a mess of lab space that's shared. Maybe you're um, contaminating equipment that people are handling with their bare hands, etc. Another thing that people often do is they exhaust the last of a resource, like the last TLC plate, the last bit of solvent, without checking if anyone needs it more than they do, or without making sure that it gets replaced. Now, sometimes stuff falls through the cracks, but more often than not, this can be mitigated with some planning and communication. Another thing that happens is people hog a particular piece of equipment, such as a rotovap or a spot on the high vac. And this is particularly a problem when uh, access to facilities is scarce, right? So there's only so many people who can use it at a given time. Another thing that happens is people will show apathy or envy towards the peers and when they have success. And so this, this can be really toxic for having a healthy lab environment. And so if you're worried about running out of something, you can plan ahead of time. So make sure you have extra solvents. Um, yeah, now it sucks that you don't have the thing that you need, but if planning doesn't occur, this is going to happen again, right? And it's going to happen again and again until you sort out a proper system to address it. And so it's important to implement a system that mitigates issues. 
if you need a particular piece of equipment, which is scarce, let's say there's an obscure round bottom flask that you need, or uh, maybe a really large Erlenmeyer or something like that, communicate with your peers and check if they need to use it. Now you might say that this is going above and beyond, but I think that's good, right? You want to go above and beyond to prevent conflict. You want to be a good person to work with. You want to be considerate, right? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And lab jobs are a good way to mitigate some of these issues. So someone can be in charge of ordering, someone can be in charge of refilling people's acetone bottles, etc. Not every lab will have all the same lab jobs, but quite often lab jobs are a good way to organize people's time. And it's a good way to see everyone has a part of, of a role on the team. And the team is, you know, exactly what it sounds like, a team. It's not just individuals doing science on their own. So one of the things that can occur is it is someone could be distracting you. And if someone talks a lot, it's easy to just say, oh, they never shut up. You know, they don't, they, all they want to do is talk instead of work. But instead of like viewing their motives as, you know, necessarily like lazy or uh, intentionally distracting for you, you know, they might have a lot going on in their life, right? You don't know what happened to them yesterday. You don't know if something happened to a family member of theirs or if, you know, something's going on. And so instead of just framing it as them trying to upset you as a burden, it's important to like fall back and refer to times when you were going through something rough and maybe you just needed to distract yourself. And think about how helpful it is when you have someone to talk to when you really need it. And so while yes, it could be because they're trying to distract you, you know, we need human attention. We need to talk to other people about what we're doing. I mean, that's probably the reason why you're listening to this video right now is you want to hear another human connect with you on a human level. And so we have a responsibility as a human to be approachable by our peers. We should feel honored that we could bear the burden of others. And I think it's easy to get too focused on ourselves as individuals. Like if you look at like a mouse or a deer, if they see another mouse or another deer that's like trapped, they'll usually help out that mouse or deer, even if it's a stranger. And I think, you know, we're people, so we should at least do as good as a, a mouse or a deer can do. Like care about those around you, especially those in your lab. And so at some point, there is a point where people need to like stop talking to you and it's important to communicate boundaries. Like, like you can say like, yeah, I can talk for five minutes, but I need to get this thing done. And then they're not going to be surprised when you cut them off later. And they're going to recognize that, oh yeah, you have other important stuff that you need to do, but that you're still being patient and giving them some of your time. And if you really don't have time to talk, be honest with them and just try and do that in a constructive, polite way, right? You don't want to just piss them off. So reflect on if you're relying too much on your peers. It's easy to assume that other people are always the problem, but it's easy to be the person that's distracting other people. And so if you're unsure if you're doing this, you should just ask them directly. And, you know, people usually answer direct questions directly, especially if, you know, it's just a one on one conversation. So envy and apathy. This is something more challenging to deal with because Oftentimes this comes from like lack of personal conscientiousness. And so it's really important to celebrate the successes of your peers. If someone comes running to you and they say like, oh, I just had this reaction to work and it didn't work a bunch of times. You need to celebrate that success with them because they're telling you because they need to share it with someone. And if you just poo poo that excitement, you're doing something terrible. Okay. So be, be the person who is able to help people celebrate their successes you know, mirror their energy and be genuinely happy for them. Don't be sarcastic. Don't try and find something to criticize about it. Just like be there. It can be easy to focus on how much you fail. And so one of the reasons why envy or apathy happens is it can feel like you're failing all the time and you might see other people succeeding and you might rationalize to yourself that they're succeeding all the time and all you do is fail and you're a failure. But the problem is you see everything you do. You see all the failures and all the, ex all the successes but someone isn't gonna tell you every time they fail and every time they succeed. They're just occasionally gonna tell you those things if you're around and you're approachable. So it's easy to get lost in that and think that, oh, you're just a failure. But honestly, most of the time in research, experiments fail. Why? Because we don't have a perfect grasp on science, right? Neither us as an individual nor us as a group of scientists, right? And so there's some really bad ways to solve conflicts. And I'm just gonna list some that I've seen people do, including myself, uh, throughout my time in research. So one thing you can do is you can hide your own private stock of resources. This could be like hiding test tubes, hiding vials, uh, hiding NMR tubes, etc. You could use lab resources when everyone else is gone. Let's say, uh, you know, everyone's left for the day, you're working longer and you just use up the rest of the hexane and then no one else gets it. And you might think, oh, the, the early bird catches the worm. And it's like, yeah, but you don't want to win if everyone else gets to lose, right? So occasionally this happens and it's necessary, but you know, it can be mitigated with planning. So it's better to plan instead of justifying why you have to do what you have to do now. Prevent you 
prevent yourself from having to justify doing things that make you feel bad. They make you feel bad for a reason, even if you bury them, right? It's good to pay attention to that. Um, another thing you could do is hog a piece of equipment so that you have it when you need it. Uh, I've seen people do this before where they'll just rotovap an empty flask so that when they uh, have their stuff ready to rotovap, they can just take the, the old flask on and put their new one on. And then people will just walk by and see rotovapping and think, oh, like it's busy right now. But this is like not cool. Like none of these things are cool, obviously. Now, um, another thing that people do is keep equipment dirty so that no one will use it. This could happen for stir bars or for common pieces of glassware that a lot of people use. Another thing you can do is just be a totally unapproachable member of the lab, wear headphones, and just totally be mean to your peers so they don't bother you with problems. But like, these are terrible, so you should not do any of these. And if you see people doing them, or if you see yourself doing them, you know, maybe try and have a moment with them or with yourself and just be like, hey, like, you know, we're all on the same team here. You know, it'd be, it'd be cool if we could, you know, enjoy being around each other since we're going to have to be here for, you know, the next four years or so together. So the, the last thing here is using up the rest of a resource so that you can get your work done. This would be like, uh, you know, finishing off the hexane, that kind of thing. So the last thing is uh, telling people to solve their own problems, just like make them go away. It's like, you you know, solve it on your own, blah, blah, blah. But, and you might do this. And I've heard of even supervisors su suggesting this type of thing before, but it's not very healthy for them as an individual. And it's not very nice for you to know that you did that, right? So I'll give you a few anecdotes. Um, the most common conflicts that I've experienced as a researcher is running out of a solvent. So something like running out of ethyl acetate or hexanes, um, using up the last of the GC vials or, you know, hogging the NMR, doing like three uh, carbon NMRs in a row in the middle of a day instead of queuing up long experiments to go overnight, or just not uh, taking care of the responsibilities that you have for lab jobs. So the first story I'll tell is the petroleum ether prohibition story. So in our lab, we had had a visiting researcher um, this has happened a few times, so I'm just going to keep it vague. And at one point in time, we had all been doing a lot of chromatography, and we got really low on um, non-polar solvent. So most of the time, we were using pentane or hexanes. I think hexanes was what we preferred to use, but then when we ran out of hexanes, um, we just used pentane. And we had already ordered new solvent ahead of time, if my memory serves correctly, but it was taking a long time to arrive, which sometimes, you know, it, even if you plan stuff just takes a while. So one of the things that happened was they were a grad student, so they got uh, selective access to the solvent. Their stuff got priority because of the funds that were used to pay for the solvent. And the rest of us still had to do research, right? We all had columns to run, but that person was unwilling to share. And so what we ended up doing was we found a bottle of petroleum ether that that person hadn't noticed, and we just put it in an unlabeled brown bottle and then hit that brown bottle and we ran columns when they weren't in the lab. Now in this case, like you might say, oh, you should have, you know, been open about that. But that guy or girl would have just used all of it. So yeah, so this is a case where maybe they should have shown a little bit more compassion to the rest of the lab. But I think all of us have been in a position where we've done the wrong thing before. So I wouldn't be too harsh against that person because, you know, I know I've hidden stuff before when I was worried about other people using it too. I'm not a perfect person. Um, I have learned a lot of things since I started research and I've got stuff running better than when I originally started. And a lot of that just comes to bearing the burden yourself. And so the next one is glassware. So most labs that I've been in have communal glassware. And what that usually means is all of the glassware is sketchy and people don't trust that it's clean and so they wash it out right before they use it. But what that means is essentially the entirety of your glassware in the lab is untrustworthy when you go to use it. What you really want is you want a lab where you can just trust any piece of glassware in a cabinet. And yeah, sometimes someone might miss something, sure, but it's better if you could just take what you need and use it when you need it instead of having to wash what you need right before you use it, right? And so what I did is over the course of several months, I cycled all of our glassware through the base bath and I cleaned all of it with water and acetone. And I got almost the entirety of the glassware in our lab clean. And then in the cabinets where we'd put our glassware, you could know that those were safe and clean to use. And you might think, well, that's a lot of unfair expectation to put on you, but you know, at least I know when I need glass, it's all clean now, right? It's all there. And so it's also beneficial if you have undergraduates in the lab because they're worse at planning, they're still learning the ropes. If you can bear that burden as a more senior lab member, the lab can run smoothly. And wouldn't it be great if people had what they need when they need it in uh, like the lab, that would be great. 
So the next story is Sharpies. So if you've worked in a lab before and you have to label vials or round bottom flasks, you quite often need a Sharpie. And it, a lot of the time there's not enough Sharpies in the lab. And so people will go and grab one out of someone else's lab coat. And then when someone will go to label, they won't be able to label stuff because they don't have their Sharpie. And so then they have to go looking around the lab for a Sharpie. And do you know what a really easy solution to this problem is? Get more Sharpies, get more Sharpies in the lab. You know, flood the lab with Sharpies so that everyone has like five of them and this never needs to be an issue ever again. And so that's what I did. And any time I encountered that problem at all, I just got enough Sharpies that the, the solution was there. The problem solved, no one's digging around looking for Sharpies anymore. And the same thing can be an issue with like rulers, pencils, pens, etc. And it's such an easy, cheap problem to solve. And it's just a matter of doing it instead of being sneaky and, you know, just leaving it. So, so there's a good rule. And so this is a rule I learned from CGP Grey from listening to Hello Internet, a podcast that he used to make with Brady Heron. And the rule was two is one, one is none. And this is a planning rule. So you don't ever want to get down to the last one. If you get down to the last one, you mentally treat that as you have none left and you need to have more. And so this would apply for toilet paper, for instance. In the lab, this would apply for a box of test tubes or a box of NMR tubes, uh, a jug of solvent. And so it's always good to have more than you need so that you don't run out entirely. It's good to have that planning going on. Another thing that I've done before is kept an extra box of vials and test tubes just separate, hidden away, that I can bring out when we get down to the last one and it runs out. And so I use that as kind of like a canary in the coal mine to order new stuff. It's better if you have a, an improved system where you don't even have to do that. But realistically, it's easier to deal with stuff when it runs out. And so it's just a matter of having a little bit of a buffer to get through that. And so I hope this has been a useful video about talking about resolving conflict with lab mates. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribed. And I hope you have a great day.